for quite a long time. And I'm just going to pick on three groups that I think have, tend to be under-recorded or ignored by sea searchers. And hopefully I'll give you some pointers um, to, see, to help you identify them when you find them on your dives. And if I try and share a screen. Right. Right, if I share that, does that make sense, Rory? Is that one looking sensible, Rory? Oh, sorry, I was muted. Yeah, no, I can see that, thanks. Grand, thank you. Um, I'm looking at gobies, gurnards, and dragonets, because they're very common fish, but very, um, very, we can seem to get very few records, or relatively few records from sea searchers. And I feel it'd be useful if people could, would be happy to, um, identify them. So we're looking at Apologies, Lynn, I've muted you by mistake. I don't know what I did there. There we go. Sorry about that. that. Yep. I don't know what I clicked on. <laughs> So looking at gobies, dragonets, which you've managed to sort out. I know that Sea Search Ireland had a project on identifying dragonets a few years back. And then gurnards seem to be another group of fish that people have difficulty identifying. And if we start from the beginning, come on, there we go. Gobies, you've got 18 species in Ireland. They're quite a um, tricky little group. Two big genera, gobius, gobies like black goby, rock goby, and then the small ones like the painted and sand gobies, amethyschistus. And then there's one or two other ones that are only one or two species in that genus. The gurnards, there's four likely species that you probably meet on a dive. They're quite a distinctive group of fish. And then the three dragonets, we have three species in Ireland. And once you've identified a dragonet, then the challenge is to know which species you've got. So, how do you recognize a goby? To start with, well, it's got two distinct dorsal fins. The first one has five bony rays in it. And this, this character here, the three rays up on the top of the pectoral fin, that's quite an important feature for you to concentrate on if you're trying to set up, separate the, the species of gobius, blacks, um, rocks, cooches, and the like. They've got a pectoral fin, which is modified as a sucker, and you can see that here, this black goby. Can, they can use it to sort of stick themselves to surfaces and currents and things particularly. Um, there's 17, 18 species on the Irish list. The adults from gobies range from about two and a half centimetres up to about 12. And it's a really large global family with over 2,000 species. And it includes Ireland's smallest adult fish, which comes in at about two and a half centimetres. When work on gobies started in Ireland in about 1901, this publication by Holt and Byrne. You keep seeing their images in books from right up until, you know, the 21st century. So this is really quite a seminal work on small fish for Ireland. And I'm sure you've probably seen some of these images in old books, the fish ID. So right, you, you know you've got a goby, then what? So if we start with the ones that don't have free those free rays on the pectoral fins, 
a small fish, usually less than about seven centimetres. You've got a big group of them, the Pomatoschistosuses, which are the painted goby, two spotted goby, common and sand gobies, the Zarnois goby, which looks almost identical to a sand goby, and I don't think, well, I know I can't identify them in the field, and the Norway goby. Jeffrey's goby is rather a different fish, and then we've got these two very pale, colourless, almost colourless fish gobies. They, grow, they live in the water column. Crystal goby is extremely common, but very rarely reported by divers. The transparent goby it turns up sort of in, from July onwards in the summer. You can find it on dives over reefs and sandy substrates. So if you look at the fish and say, has it got pectoral and free pectoral rays? So you can see this head on picture of a sand goby. There aren't any free rays up at the top here, at the top of the pectoral fin. So that's a sand goby. This is Jeffrey's goby. Again, it hasn't any free rays up here. It has other distinctive characters. This one, it's got very big eyes, which are set high on top of the head. They often have that green color to them too. And then you've got the transparent goby again without rays on the top of the fins there. So that's quite a useful character to separate out these guys from the gobius species. So if you go into looking at what the, how to um, identify the sand gobies in that group, Pomatoschistus, the best character I found is to look at the distribution of scales. People say, oh, well, you can't see scales on these small fish. But when we were putting together the book, we were looking at lots of pe people's pictures of these small fish and a lot of the images, the majority of the images do show these, this reticulation of scales. So, you know, if you've got a camera, this is really quite a useful character. I can't personally see these in the field, but maybe those sharp-eyed youngsters might be able to. But it's the distribution of these scales on the fish that helps you identify which one you've got. So if you look at this green line is the first dorsal fin, in the middle of the body of the fish. And then this pink line across it shows where the visible scales stop. So in the sand goby, pretty well the whole body scaled right from the, just in, in front of the pectoral fins backwards. In the painted goby, it's sort of one third of the way down that first dorsal fin, going down to the pectoral fins. And you really can see this in photographs. It doesn't have to be a high power SLR image. You, you can, it works very well on some of those smaller cameras as well. The common goby, which I find difficult to distinguish from the sand goby, the scales don't start till right behind first dorsal fin. And then the Norway goby, which is fairly rare, they come just to the forefront of that first dorsal fin. And I haven't got a picture of the two spotted goby because I'm hoping that most of you will be able to recognize that particular fish. I have seen Jeffrey's gobies um, confused with this the sand goby, common goby group. Again, the distribution of scales is slightly different. They tend to be rather bigger than the these small gobies. The scales are bigger, and they start just in front of the dorsal fin and behind the pectorals. So if we zoom in on these and have a closer look at another character, which is the first dorsal fin, that's quite a useful feature if the fish is obliging enough to display it, of course. The common goby, this blue spot, which is quite distinctive, particularly in breeding males, tends to be closer to the back of the fish, right, not right at the edge of the fin membrane, which you can see here. So then if you go to look at the sand gobies, they still have a similar spot, but it's much further out, right on the edge of the fin there. And if you watch the fish for a, 
a while they, they flick their fins, especially if there are other ones around. So that character can be quite easily caught on a, in a, on a camera. Painted gobies, people seem to have a bit of trouble with them, particularly the less well marked ones. This one here on the right is a male, beautiful blue stripes. The really critical thing for the painted goby are these black marks on the fin, parallel lines of marks. And practically any painted goby, even when it's extremely small, will have these black marks on the first dorsal fin. And that will tell you what you've got. Because part of the trouble with all these fish is that colour is extremely variable. So colour really isn't a particularly useful tool for identifying. And then finally, we've got the Norway goby, which pretty well doesn't have any marks at all on the first dorsal fin. It's pretty well translucent. These rusty spots are quite characteristic as well of that species. I have seen Jeffrey's goby confused with um, the painted goby. I find the best character for this fish is this beautiful iridescent blue sort of um, frosting on the front of the fin here. None of the other species have quite that colour. And particularly the males have this very greatly extended second fin ray, which none of the Pometrochistus species have. And now for comparisons, the painted goby, it fins a different shape. The blue's a different blue. And it should be fairly easy to distinguish them, bearing in mind that you might be confusing these two fish. Um, Norway goby, I'm sure there ought to be more Irish records. I would expect it in Killary or Strangford. It likes these sort of rather soft, muddy substrates. It's a very, it's a very slim goby. A particular character I find useful are the rusty red spots, which most of the others don't have. And this um, dark mark below the first dorsal fin here, you can see this in the female here. And then there's another one at the base of the tail. It shows up better on this fish here with the dark mark below the first dorsal fin. And you can quite often count the rays in the pectoral fin here, because they very often sit with those nicely displayed. So if you think, you know, when you're taking pictures of these fish, what characters do I need to be able to identify them accurately? Try and get in there with your camera and get the necessary images. So your pectoral fin rays are 17 in this one. They tend to be 18 to 20 in the other species. And I think they do tend to look much slimmer than some of the other goby. So this one here obviously is a female, probably with eggs. So she looks stouter. Two spotted gobies, I'm sure everybody's familiar with those. Um, you generally think of them being up in the water column, but at this time of year, particularly when the water temperature is low, they tend to sit around on the seabed in a rather sluggish way. And people often confuse them there with other, with the um, painted gobies, perhaps. The males always have two nice dark spots, hence two spotted. The females tend not to be quite so well marked on the front, the one below the first dorsal fin, but you still can see the, a faint hint of it there. And then these last two small, well, two small gobies, the transparent ones. They're very difficult to catch on in the water column. They tend to rush about in very small shoals. Sometimes at night you find them comatose on the seabed, so you night divers might be lucky to find a cooperative fish. The best character I found is the length and height of the first door, the second dorsal fin and the anal fin. 
So in the transparent goby, it's a fairly tall fin. And it has 12 to 14 rays. And you can usually see those in pictures of these fish. So, or at least you can see you've got 14 as opposed to the crystal, which has much lower fin, you know, not quite such a high fin, and with more than with 18 to 20 rays. And I think probably the crystal goby is probably a commoner fish, but it's much less frequently recorded by divers than the transparent goby, which we do see sort of in shore. We had them in Mulroy Bay in July last year, last year. I don't know, two or three sites there. Probably all familiar with the good old leopard spotted goby. No free rays. It's a big fish compared with the other ones we've been talking about. Dark brown spots, slightly orange on the head very often. And if you get really close in, you can see these rows of sensory papillae, black ones. But this one lacks those free rays. And another one which is common round Ireland is Freeze's goby, another one that likes muddy sediments. And again, here you can see that there are no free rays at the top of the petrol fin there. These also have quite well developed um, sensory rows of sensory papillae on the head. It's quite common in Loch Ine. They're very handsome fish, bright orange, silvery. They can be rather um, tricky to photograph, the dashing off into the gloom. You tend to get them in dark, deep, muddy spots like some of the sites in Loch Ine. And I suspect it's, they're under recorded round Ireland if you can find the right habitat. So we've got them in um, Kenmad Bay, Bantry Bay, Loch Ines, a well known site for them. They have been recorded from Strangford and Belfast Locks. And then we have all these ones in Killary, I think that one is, isn't it? Yes. And in Kilkiran as well. So, you know, if you're out on a muddy seabed, do keep a lookout for these gobies because they're obviously, I'm sure they're more widely distributed than those records suggest. Now, if you get down to the really small ones, less than two centimetres, less than an inch, quite solid looking small fish. This one's they got a bright white root to the tail. The females are sort of chocolatey brown and brindled. And sometimes you can see this ridge of raised scales along the side of the body, which is distinctive of this particular genus of fish. The males are quite spectacular. This isn't a particularly well-dressed one, but bright white first dorsal fin and then this black and white yellow second dorsal. But remember, this thing's not more than an inch long, so they're quite challenging to see. And you can see from the habitat around that they'd be very well camouflaged as well. Really, the thing that gives them away is when they scoot off, you, you know, you cat, your eye catches the movement. There aren't many Irish records. There's one from Clare Island, a few from Ballinakill, and then Manin Bay is the most recent record. So, you know, anybody who's out there diving on Merle or slightly gravelly bottoms, do look out for this fish because I'm quite sure it's more common than the records suggest. Holt and Byrne, after all, had them in their 1901 paper. This one's Gillet Guillet's gobies, the smallest fish in Ireland. Females are very variable. You can see from this photograph how small the fish is, because these are just bits of gravel, probably, I don't know, three, three mil across, maybe maximum. So you can see it's a very small fish. And this gives you some idea of scale, because this is a pair. The females out here, with the male hiding under a shell, half a shell on bits of gravel that's probably, I don't know, less than a mil across. So they're extremely small fish. 
but again, they give themselves away by their movement. They tend to scoot from one spot to another and then sit still again and hope you've missed them. So if you can keep an eye on them, there's quite a chance you can follow them around the habitat quite effectively. There's a few old Irish records from Galway Bay, from Galway, Melbeds, Kilkeran and Marinish. And the last records I could find from 1976 by these people who were working out of Galway. So then we move on to ones with three upper rays. We've got the black goby here. You can just see the first two or three rays are branched and just the ends are free. And these, this fish also has very dark black rows of sensory papillae on the head. This one's a breeding male, it's in Mulroy Bay. He actually came out and bit me, this one. It's fairly defending its territory very effectively. Black spot on the first dorsal fin, sometimes obvious. And this is a very plain colored fish. Very often they're much more sandy colored. So just keep in mind that when people say black goby, 90% of your pictures of black gobies will not be black. The odd male, breeding male you find might fit that label, but very often they're going under some other guy. So you need to not get too fixated on colour. Coochie's goby. Ireland's got some really well, um, good distribution of this species. Again, you can just see three rays up here. Another character for this particular species is this black spot on the bottom of the pectoral fin here. It's widely distributed in Ireland and I'm quite sure it's under recorded. Loch Ine, got them in Kinmare Bay, one record off Dingle, got them in Kilkeran, Salt Lake, up in Mulroy, and I sure if you could find suitable habitat, muddy, fairly sheltered habitat. I'm sure there's more locations along the west coast up here and probably in Bantry Bay as well. Rock goby is a very cheeky little fish I always think. You can see these beautiful long silky free rays on its fin and when I was learning to distinguish these from black gobies and coochies goby, this was the most reliable character I could find. So again, when you're photographing a fish, try and think about what features you need to capture and see if you can get that in, in your photographs. And they often have these little pale white eyebrows, rather cheeky expression, small little scales on top of the head there. And you can't see the black, the sensory papillae. They're still there, obviously, but they're not black like they are in black goby. Red mouth goby, they're pretty distinctive fish if you find them. Again, they've got three rays up here. The really good character, of course, this is red mouth, hence the name. And I, again, I think this one's more widely distributed than the records suggest. So um, most recent northerly record I've had is from James Conroy from Killary, just mouth of Killary Harbour. This one here in Galway Bay is a really old one from about the 1930s, but there haven't been any records that I've found since. I mean, if you as sea searchers and um, fish biologists know better, for, do try and get your records into the National Biodiversity Data Centre or somewhere because it's, you know, stuck on your hard drive isn't very useful. We've got them in Kenmare Bay, Bantry Bay, and of course Loch Hines, an absolutely classic site, which is where they were first recognised as being part of the Irish fauna in about 1930, I think. So whistletop toast through gobies. Gurnards, we found when we started looking for photographs for the fish guide, that we had difficulty in getting um, images of gurnards that have been correctly identified. So we've tried to produce some sort of table of how to crack these particular group of fish. They're fairly distinctive. 
with these three finger-like feelers, the point base of the pectoral fin. They often look rather bony and rigid, I feel, a bony kind of head, large first and second dorsal fins. Um, and for goodness sake, don't get fixated on colour for gurnards because they all can come in red. And most of them also have other colourways. So don't, just because it's red, it's not, may not be a red gurnard. Useful um, feature to look for is the lateral line. So if you can get photographs again, you know, get a good picture of the whole fish and then maybe if it gives you a chance, try and move in and see if you can capture that detail. And another useful character is the slope of the head. You know, after you've looked at several of them and wondered about it, that becomes a fairly useful character as well, I think. So the red gurnard, it's got a fairly 45 degree slope to its head. The best feature I find are these huge lateral line scales. You can see them here showing up as quite broad, long scales. So again, if you, like in this picture here, haven't really got the whole fish, but you've got enough information on the lateral line structure here and the shape of the head to be confident that it is a red gurnard. And this time it is coming, showing a red color. So that's quite helpful. Street gurnards, they're often confused with red ones. They've got a rather steeper slope to the head, sort of 60 degrees rather than the 45 of the red gurnard. The lateral lines, a series of small spines facing backwards, but the really useful character here are these vertical lines above and below the lateral line. And pretty well, you know, you don't really need a detailed picture of the fish to give you that impression. And then just to show what sort of variation these particular fish will do. This one's here growing on, living on a mole bed in Falmouth. It's a very different color to this muddy one or Dorset this one was. And then this one here in a muddy habitat in Scotland. It's again, a very different color. So color again, don't get bothered by color. Tub Gurnard. We couldn't find very many images of this one. It's got a fairly straight front to its head. The best character here again, I think, is the lateral line here. You can see it shows up as a dark ridge, very narrow ridge. And the rest of the body is fairly smooth, so you haven't got those vertical lines that the streaked Gurnard had. And again, this one here is showing slight red coloration, despite the fact that it's living on a fairly soft, muddy habitat there. And then I think this is the, the common one for juveniles anyway. Um, I've seen adults on the Orkney Skate Trust um, website. They have, they do turn up on their baited video, but I've never seen um, any images of a grey gurnard adult from Ireland or Scotland, certainly not from sea searchers anyway. The juveniles tend to have a rather dished front to the head. Adults, it's nearly straight. This dark spot on the first dorsal, a very good character. And they're usually fairly happy to show that to you as they flick around in the habitat. So that's not a difficult one to find. They usually mottle the brown, greenish, reddish on top. And they always often have this fairly bright white belly. And the, the lateral line, it's quite well developed spiny lateral line. And I find in my photographs, the best place to look to see how the spiny it is, is around at the tail end here, where it seems to be more strongly developed. So again, you know, taking your photographs, think, what features do I need to identify a gurnard accurately? More variety in colors of a gray gurnard. 
dark smudge on the first dorsal shows quite well in this one. Nearly absent in this one, unhelpfully. And then here you can see too the different the colours on the top side of the pectoral fin compared with the top, the lower side. So depending on which how the fish is holding its fin, it will it will vary on how you actually see the colour. So that's something to look out for. And again, they come in red. So, but you can still see this dark smudge on the first dorsal. And if you zoomed in on this image, you'd be able to see the backward pointing spines along the lateral line. Dragonettes, right. Two distinct dorsal fins, rather triangular shaped fish. Females and immature males have a very short first dorsal. Whereas the adult males have this enormously well-developed first dorsal and terrific colours. And these are really the most ones easy to identify, but of course these aren't the ones that divers see. I've seen very few images of adult males. I've never seen one myself displaying like this. If you disturb one, it, you're lucky to see the fins, you know, for a split second. So it's very difficult to capture on film. Um, it's probably easier with video, so as you can then freeze frame that. So the spotted dragonette, I think that one's fairly easily identified. It's often pinkish. It grows on soft, muddy, it lives on soft, muddy sediments. And the males particularly have these sort of iridescent blue spots on the pectoral fins, which is quite characteristic of that species. They have sort of pearly marks down the side and they have these huge googly eyes. The tops are usually white because very often you find them buried and the only thing you can see are the tops of the eyes, which then match bits of shell and stuff in the sediment. So they can be extremely well camouflaged. The females don't have these marks on the pe pectoral fins, but you can see here it's pinkish tinge to the fish, sitting on a nice muddy soft seabed, but it hasn't got any sort of spangly markings on the pectoral fins here pelvic fins, pectorals and pelvics. Um, there aren't very many records from Ireland. Um, these pictures from here have been from, Libby's was from Drangford Lock. This is a nice picture of a, an immature male. You can clearly see the spangly markings on the pectoral and pelvic fins and the hint of blue and black on the dorsal fin here. Went, who produced a, a, he produced a list of Irish fish in 1969, said it was known to be common, not uncommon. It's, so on the suitable habitats, I suspect divers don't see it because they don't dive so often on muddy sediment. But there aren't any records on the um, Irish biodiversity website as far as I can remember. But I'm sure that's something that more people would be seeing, especially those of you doing Strangford Lock, Killary, and muddy sites, probably in Kilkiran, possibly. Worth looking out for that one. Right, so that leaves us with the two tricky ones, common and reticulated dragonets. Um, I've been working with Chris Lewis on this. I set him a challenge at the beginning of lockdown and said, go and sort out dragonets. And two years later, he's come back with an answer, which I think works quite nicely. And he's also worked, been in touch with Patrick Rossi, who works, uh, produces, works on the continent. He's a French ichthyologist, and he's produced quite a useful guide to um, European fish, so that covers everything from the Mediterranean through to Norway. So 
he's had quite a lot of experience looking at these animals. And Chris and Patrick's conclusion is that the best character for distinguishing these two fish is the saddle spacing. So you're looking at a common dragonet, common dragonet here. The space between the first sort of shield on the back of the fish and the second one, and then the proportion of that to this space between the second and back to the tail. So if X is less than or equal to Y, you've got a common dragonet. And really you do need to take the photograph of the fish in a, at a suitable angle to be sure of that measurement. Because you can then stick it up on your screen and use a ruler. It can be rather um, deceptive as to the actual size of these. So Chris and I certainly stick them up and zoom in on them on the screen and then measure it with a ruler or something like that. So, and don't get, again, don't get fixated on colour. For females and immature males, colour is virtually useless. These fish are particularly good mimics of their background. So depending on where they are, like here on a rather muddy, shelly habitat, they're brown and, brown and greyish. If they're out on mole, they'd be red and blue almost. And then out on the mud, they'd be plain and rather drab looking fish, but they're all the same species. If you're looking at immature males, it's, we know it's an immature male, so you've got this extended first ray of the dorsal fin, first dorsal, and they're usually quite happy to display that, so that's quite a useful feature to have. So that's a fairly pale, clear fin. And here, X is shorter than or equal to Y. Again, that's something you'd have to measure on your screen. And this is a much redder fish. It's in a mole bed somewhere. So again, colour, don't get bothered by colour. Two more common dragonets. These are the sort of, both of these show clearly X is less than or equal to Y if you sit there and measure them on your screen. This one's in a mole bed, so you've got beautiful red, blue, shield marks and spotting down the side. Whereas this male, young male here, the immature male, on a more drab background, rather greyish and not particularly flamboyant. But the crucial character, provided you've got a good view of the fish, sideways or top down as here, you can measure your X and your Y. If it, X is less than or equal to Y, you've got common dragonet. Immature males again, extended first ray here. And if you're lucky enough to find one displaying, you can count the dorsal, the rays in the second dorsal fin. And for a common dragonet, there are nine. The reticulated has 10, usually. Of course, there are some sports that may have 10 or eight. So again, you know, these are, Together, you need several characters to be sure that you've got this particular fish. Anyway, and this one here, X is less than Y. So another useful character, if you've got is a, any dragonet bigger than about 12 centimeters, is going to be a common dragonet. Dragonet. This is a female. She's probably about 13 or 14 centimeters. You can think, well, how do you measure a fish in a habitat? So what Chris and I do sometimes is we take the photograph of the fish. It'll then go away and you can then lay down a ruler or some scale object in the space where the fish was and take another photograph. That way you can then get a rough idea or a better idea of the actual size of the fish. So, you know, you go around with a ruler and just when the fish is shot off after you've photographed it, you can stick your ruler down in the same place and you can get a feel for the size of the animal. So you can move on to the reticulated. Chris has got some really nice video now of the fish um, displaying in sight from sites in Scotland. 
And in these fish, X is longer than Y. So you've got your first shield here, second one, space between, and then second back to the tail. Measure that distance and decide which fish you've got. And again here, this is a young male, X is greater than Y. And again, you know, if you're taking pictures of your fish, don't try and, you know, get at least one that holds the, shows the whole fish. So then you can make these measurements and then maybe move in to get more detail around the head. And particularly the first dorsal fin, you notice here that in this female, it's a really black membrane on the dorsal fin. And that's another useful character for this particular species. This is a male reticulated dragonet. You can see the terrific colors on these fins. I think I followed this one round for a very long time and never once did it display anything, but that was in October. And I think if you look out in June, July, when they're actually mating, you're very likely to catch them with their fins beautifully displayed. And once when you have that, there's no doubt that you've got a reticulated dragonet. Fairly recently discovered in England, first one 1949 in Devon. First Irish record, County Galway, 1967. And certainly from dredging surveys and such like, it seems that the reticulated dragonet is not, not as common as the common dragonet. So that's reassuring. Um, other characters to try and help pin down these tricky little animals. It's the height of the eye in the head. So you can see here the eye, the relative height of the eye to the whole of the head there. So if you compare the height of the eye to the rest of the head, common dragonet A is less than B, articulated a equals B. And you can see that here. I always think very often common dragonets look like rather piggy eyed fish, you know, very small eye and quite a big general head. Whereas the reticulated, I always think, looks more sprightly and possibly brighter with the height of the eye pretty well matching the height of the rest of the head. And again, if you're taking photographs, you've got the picture of your whole fish. You can then zoom in and try and get a good right angle view of the head so as you can have a stab at estimating that proportion as well. And one other character for these animals, common dragonet, first dorsal fin. This is these two are immature males. This is a female. That first membrane is usually white between the first and second dorsal fin rays. It's plain. And as the young males grow mature slowly, they, that the amount of pigment seems to reduce in that first dorsal fin. But it's quite clear here that it's pretty plain in that first membrane there. And again, note the color, but it, different colors, really marked, strongly marked fish here a rather muddy colored one in a more muddy habitat. Then if you look at the reticulated, much darker, blacker, this is a female, first dorsal fin, and it's only the, the ray that is pale. The rest of the, there's no um, pale uh, membrane like there is in the common dragonette. So, you know, if you're trying to photograph the fish, see if you can catch that. I haven't got very many photographs of that character. I think probably Chris Lewis is the one who has the most at the moment. Because between us, we've got hundreds of images of common and reticulated dragonets, which we've spent many happy evenings measuring proportions on. I think the vital thing with any fish ID is to remember colour isn't always a reliable guide. All these photos here are 
uh, common dragonette. This black and white one here is on a black and white sandy sediment. This one's on a, on a merl bed. This one's matching its rocky background with these red algae very nicely. And this young male here is matching the sandy habitat behind. And of course, you know, it depends on the breeding season, displaying and the time of day. Fish do put on pajamas, so they can look very different at night. Some of those gobies, if you see them in the night, you know, you'd hardly recognize them from their daytime um, appearance. But they're often more easy to add to photograph at night because they're a bit more just sat around. So, you know, it's difficult to match make sure you match your black goby in his pajamas with the one in the daytime. Right, so no more resources. These are fairly broad general guides. Sharks and Rays is a fairly new book out on that. There's Patrick Loisi's Mediterranean and European book. And I think with um, climate change, it's worth you know, if you really can't match your fish with something from the Irish list, do consider having a look at Mediterranean guides. You may have something that's nipped up from Spain or across from France. Henderson's quite a useful guide, not in, not in print anymore. It's got information on the um, finray counts and things if you need those. Paul Kay and Francis Dipper's Guide to Marine Fishes of Wales. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that one. I quite like this Baldwin Wheeler's Guide, which has been revamped by the Environment Agency. And it is possible to find an online um, PDF of that if you hunt around. And that again has um, nice drawings. Some of those ones are the Gobies outlines there. They do it in that style. And again, they have good detail of fin ray counts and that sort of thing. If you're looking for northern fish, the Svensons, Erling and Rudolf Svensson, have some stunning photographs and they're accurately identified, obviously, which is obviously an essential thing to keep in mind. Uh, the Shark Trust for again for sharks and rays and they also have a very good guide to shark and skate eggs. You go back to um, Patrick Rossi's work, his fishwatch.org, it's a French site but it's got a terrific range of images of each fish species, you know it's not just one animal so it has quite a variety of um, different images of a fish, which can be quite useful. And then if you want to check, once you've identified your fish, is it likely to be where you actually recorded it? So the Biodiversity Ireland website is a useful starting point, but it desperately needs more data, more information to be fed into it. So, you know, don't just leave your pictures of these rare, apparently rare fish just sitting on your hard drive, do try and get them out to some other source, you know, either through sea search or some other way of getting it into the public domain. And then for uh, the UK, the NBN Atlas provides quite a good summary of particularly volunteer and records rather than the commercial ones, which are sometimes not so easy to find. And then, as Rory mentioned, this book should be coming out on the 18th of April. And it's got quite a lot of detail. You know, these characters are all, for the gobies, they're all put out in tables so you can work through and see which characters you've got and which animal they then might fit. So there's quite a lot of information in there drawn together as, as a common table. And that's where I'm stopping. Thank you for your listening. I guess the question is, any questions now? <laughs>